The year 1515, Leonardo da Vinci designed and built the Ottoman Lion. In 1939, a robotic dog named Sparco entertained crowds. 1963, the first animatronics called Audio Animatronics, created by Disney, took the form of the enchanted Tiki Birds followed the next year by the film Mary Poppins, and the first ever use of animatronics in a film in the form of some more birds. Animatronics have had a very long and interesting history, and the way how they came into fruition is filled with crazy stories and even crazier builds. What started out as a way to please the local crowds eventually turned into a way to entertain and interact with millions around the world. Ever since the first animatronic called the A100 enchanted visitors at the Walt Disney Resort, the world of animatronics has gone on to make some of the best scenes in film history. One of the most famous uses of animatronics are that of the groundbreaking series of films that we all know as Jurassic Park. Starting off with the original film, Stan Winston and his excellent team developed not only numerous highly advanced robotic dinosaurs, but also the largest and quite possibly most famous animatronic of all time, the Mighty T-Rex. For over a decade, Stan and his team worked on this franchise, creating these majestic robotic creatures. And today, we bring to you a very special guest, Matt Winston. Stan's son and longtime actor. Get your popcorn, grab a nice seat, and enjoy. All right, Matt. So, thank you for joining us today. I'm sure everybody's pretty excited to talk about this just as much as I am. So, first question I have for you, because today we're kind of be, you know, kind of talking about your dad and how he worked with, you know, the Jurassic Park movies. When you were a kid. What was the coolest thing that you kind of remembered him making? Like, when oh you were very gosh, young? yeah. Well, I would say one of the coolest things um, I experienced as a kid was when Dad was working on the Planet of the Apes TV series, uh, and he had also worked on some of the film sequels. But for the TV series, he had some leftover prosthetics, uh, and he used them to transform me into a real deal ape from the Planet of the Apes from my kindergarten class. And I remember walking around the the school after I was in makeup and I never had that kind of excitement or attention in my life. And I was like, wow, this makeup is pretty powerful stuff. So that was my probably one of my earliest memories of realizing how cool my dad's job was. All right, so you just said what was your, you know, coolest experiences with him, or I guess the better way of putting this, did you help him really with any builds before you got old, you know, as a kid, what did you really help him? Yes, with? um, I would say uh, starting around the age of 13 is when I started working at the studio with my dad. You know, he had a strong work ethic and he felt I should learn that same work ethic. So whether it was weekends or summer breaks, I would be at the shop um, learning the the basics of creature creation. So, you know, mold making, uh, basic mechanical lab work, learning how to run foam and, and silicone and that sort of thing. So I was exposed to lots of good toxic chemicals at a young age. Um, <laughs> which is, I think, important for all kids. you got to get that in early. <laughs> and, and then eventually, uh, Dad would allow me, and this was the fun part, to puppeteer the, the creations that I'd worked on um, at the studio on set. And that was really the payoff. And that continues to be the payoff for many people who make monsters and creature effects, is that after you're finished building, you get to take those characters on set and bring them to life. And I loved doing that. So, yeah, for, for example, I got to puppeteer on Aliens, James Cameron's sequel to Alien. I got to puppeteer in some of the Alien Queen sequences and in some of the scenes with the uh, warrior uh, alien xenomorphs. And then uh, my biggest puppeteering job, of course, was on Jurassic Park. I was on that for the entire shoot. I got to work on every single dinosaur team except for the Triceratops. 
Um, that was out in Hawaii, but all the stuff that was shot in Los Angeles, I got to work on all those dinosaurs. So, oh, yeah, cool. So you had like a really expanded role in the Jurassic Park. You know, the, was it just the original Jurassic Park, or was it? Yeah, that that was the last. That was the one that I spent the entire shoot working on. Um, and then after that, I went off and said to my dad, "I'm going to go be an actor now." Uh, and so I didn't work on the sequels. Although I would visit set and I would visit the studio and I would see the progress, but I wasn't employed as a crew member on, on those uh, sequels. So obviously, your dad pretty much helped make Jurassic Park as big and as famous as it is today. But did he work on any other dinosaur sort of related projects before that, or was that his one or big hit with dinosaurs? Jurassic Park was Dad's first and ultimate the dinosaur movie as a as a creature creator uh before then he had not had the opportunity to do dinosaurs and that's one of the reasons he went after the project so hard it is is because it was a chance to fulfill a childhood dream and, and make dinosaurs i think uh everyone on his crew felt the same way this was a chance to to fulfill a childhood dream i mean every kid loved dinosaurs so uh yeah this was a first for him and a first for his team Okay, so since you just pretty much said this was his first kind of, you know, dinosaur build, how really, how really long did it take for these these ginormous, you know, animatronics to be made? Uh, it was all in from the very beginning until the completion of principal photography. It was a three-year process. Uh, the first year was devoted to design. Uh, deciding which dinosaurs would be in the film and making sure that the designs were dialed in. Uh, once that was done, the film was officially greenlit, and Dad and his team had a year to build uh, the dinosaurs before filming would commence. So once filming started, it was it was all about finishing touches. You know, some of the dinosaurs still had some time on the schedule to be completed, but, but most of the, the key building had to be done uh, at the end of that, that build year. So all, all told, it was a three-year process. See, that's really cool. I don't think a lot of viewers really understand that. I think they, they see it on the screen and they hear about it and they're probably like, oh, so Stan and his team must have just took like a month or two before that to put it into the film. When in reality, it was like years in advance. And that, that's awesome. That's the sort of kind of insight that I feel like a lot of people are going to, you know, hear for the first time. So Yeah, I mean, the, the, the movie wasn't 65 million years in the making, but it was three years in the making. <laughs> and if you include the time Michael Crichton spent writing the book previous to that, you know, we're looking at something like five to six years in the making. All right. So within, I guess, your one role with Jurassic Park, and now your dad, he was on all three of the films. What was yours and his favorite build from, I guess, all three films? Even? Well, that's an easy question to answer. Uh, the, although Stan loved all of the dinosaurs that he and his team got to build, and so did I, uh, his favorite, as was my favorite, what had to be the T-Rex from the first film um, for several reasons. I mean, number one, just the sheer size and audacity of of that build of that creation was a, truly set a new bar it was the pinnacle of animatronics at that time no one had ever attempted something that was that expressive and that large for a movie and uh it it came out beautifully and and it was to be on set with that t-rex was unlike any experience i've ever had uh before or since and i know dad felt the same way he was so proud of that creation so it would definitely have That's to be awesome. the T-Rex. And that totally makes sense because you said it was like the pinnacle of animatronics back then. But, you know, personally, I still think it's the pinnacle to nowadays. I mean, that T-Rex looks better than a lot of new stuff that comes out. So I really have to give it props to, you know, everybody involved on that. The cool thing about the T-Rex, and of course we love the raptors and the brachiosaurus from the first one and the spitter and the hatchling raptor and the triceratops and all of them. But the T-Rex really was, and still to this day remains, you know, 
probably the largest mechanical character that could take direction in real time um, in Hollywood history was, was that T-Rex. And that was something that was so astounding about it is, is that although it had the ability to be pre-programmed, uh, most of the time it was being um, operated in real time based on Steven Spielberg's direction. And, and that was incredible. So this next question, Matt, is actually from another YouTuber. He's a fellow friend of ours, and he really wanted... He actually makes videos on strictly pretty much Jurassic Park stuff, so he wanted to make sure and give his little his little chance in all this. So I'm going to ask you the question that he has for you. So when the T-Rex broke out, and it's pretty much attacking uh, everybody, and specifically with, uh, I believe it was the Explorer car that they were all in, what went involved into that to make it look so dang real? Now, we've talked about how good the T-Rex um, looked and all that, but just everything regarding the T-Rex animatronic in that scene, how did it just look so good? Well, I mean, the big reason that that sequence still looks so good to this day is that, number one, the majority of the shots in that sequence are of a real puppet, of the real T-Rex on the set. You know, out of 15 minutes of dinosaur footage in that movie, nine minutes are real and only six minutes are CGI. So that's the, the number one thing that makes that uh, road attack sequence look so good is that it really was a lot of real shots. Um, but the other thing that makes it uh, look real is that the environment itself, the, the car, uh, all of it was also rigged by the floor effects team led by Michael Lantieri so that Whatever the T-Rex puppet was doing to the vehicle, the vehicle would appropriately react. You know, things would break, it would spin, you know. So the environment was being, was, was a part of the scene as well, you know. I think that also helps. I, th I think the acting is a big part of it. You know, the reaction of those kids and the reaction of, of all of them is, is helps sell it. I mean, if you have a sequence, no matter how great the effect is, if the actors aren't believably scared while well, the audience isn't going to be scared but they were scared in that scene because there was a you know multi thousand ton machine that could have killed them at any moment and it was scary to be around that thing you know the sequences where the t-rex where you're looking up and the t-rex is bashing down through the the um the the roof the uh the roof window that was real i mean there's <laughs> very heavy dinosaurs smashing down through that uh, that window and pushing the car and rocking the car and it was just real you know that's the reason it looks so real is because it was real you know and of course there were some great CG shots where you needed a full body shot or it was going to walk through the frame but most of that attack sequence is a robot and uh, that's why it looks so great it looks real because it is real that's right all right, so this is Clayton's second question for you, Matt. Now, I know you said you didn't really work on Lost World or Jurassic Park 3, but his question is, you know, if you know this, uh, in Lost World, when the character Eddie Carr is getting pulled up by the two T-Rexes, there's actually a real-life actor in the very first part of this scene inside the animatronic's mouth. Now, earlier you just said how big and dangerous and powerful these machines are. How exactly, from your knowledge, was this pulled off so it was safe? Yes, uh, that sequence, yes, you're right. That was a stuntman in the Rex's mouth, and that was rehearsed uh, many times at the studio before that animatronic was even brought to the set um, because if it had gone wrong, you could have just ripped the stuntman's arm off completely. So one of the things they did was... Um, <clears throat> the, there was a harness that the stuntman was wearing that was actually fastened to uh, the interior you know, structure of the T-Rex's mouth so that the, the arm itself wasn't being bit down on at all. Um, it, the, the harness was supporting the actor's weight. And this, as I said before, the T-Rex was capable of a real-time performance based on uh, Steven Spielberg's direction, or it could be pre-programmed for dangerous moves. And this was one of those examples of, of a sequence where they did pre-program this move uh, to make sure that it was totally safe. Hmm. Yeah, that's good. That's crazy how technology 25 years ago was able to really do this with such a huge 
kind of thing like this. That's so crazy. And I mean, you look back on stuff like that and you think, oh, that's a long time ago. Movies weren't really nothing. But like technology was crazy even back then. And that's that's just super cool to learn that. So cool. Absolutely. All right. So with these animatronics from, you know, what you know, how long did they last and where are they now if they're still existing? Um, well, unfortunately, and this is true of all Hollywood props, uh, Hollywood props, Hollywood characters, uh, animatronics are really not built to last, built to last. Uh, they're built to look really good for the duration of the shoot for a few months. So we're talking about, you know, foam latex, which eventually turns to dust over time, silicones, which eventually leak and, and, and turn to fluid almost over time. So it was only a couple years before the skins started to deteriorate on all of the, all the dinosaurs, um, and they became useless. But what happened was uh, uh, some of the animatronics were just reskinned or repurposed for sequels. Uh, for example, the um, T-Rex from 1 was repurposed for uh, Part 2, and then they also built a new one. And then one of the T-Rexes they built for Lost World was also repurposed for Jurassic Park 3. Uh, for the Spinosaurus fight scene. So they'd be repurposed, reskinned, but after all three movies were done, it was made very clear that that was the end of the franchise. And so the larger robots were disassembled. They were just too large to, to store, and they weren't really functional uh, beyond you know, what they were built for for the movie. And the skins just kind of went away. So, so most of them are are gone. Some of the um, animatronic understructures, though, are at museums. Uh, Paul Allen's Sci-Fi Museum up in Seattle has some stuff. Uh, there's a cool um, Sci-Fi Museum in New York that has some stuff. The Academy Museum. So there is some stuff, but most of it just deteriorates, unfortunately, just like the real dinosaurs. Yeah, just like the real dinosaurs, they are now extinct. And that's that actually, you know, what you just said kind of goes for. I was just looking into the Godzilla suits recently and I actually kind of researched up on them and I realized or learned that from those they actually dissipated after a couple of years as well so like you said Hollywood props they're made for that you know that moment and then they drift away and that's that's kind of cool though I'm okay with that I think yeah yeah I mean they're meant to be captured on screen and once that once that's done they've served their purpose so obviously Jurassic Park is no more but Jurassic World is now in existence so did you guys work on this at all in any sort of way? And do you think that the Fallen Kingdom, the next Jurassic World's claim on having more animatronics is a good thing for this new Jurassic series? Uh, well, the, the first, uh, the Jurassic, Jurassic World was worked on by Dad's team. Uh, they, since Dad's passing, have been working under the banner Legacy Effects. And they built the, uh, the sick Apatosaurus uh, animatronic for Jurassic World. And they also worked extensively on the design phase for most of the dinosaurs in the movie and did a lot of maquettes and, and that sort of thing. Uh, unfortunately, um, the new film was shot in the UK. And it, it would have been absolutely okay. impossible to ship dinosaurs across the world uh, for this movie. So they hired a UK shop and uh, they, they hired someone fabulous. His name is Neil Scanlon. He also is responsible for the Star Wars, uh, the effects in the new Star Wars films. So I think the fact that they are building more practical dinosaurs for this franchise is only a good thing. I think that the mixture of, of real and CG are what made the the first three Jurassic movies work so well, so it makes perfect sense to me that they would try and strike that same balance, um, especially starting with the second film and moving forward. So I'm really excited to see the, the dinosaurs they built for it. That's awesome, and I think you and uh, a few million other people are very excited to see animatronics again. That was probably the biggest kind of downside to the you know Jurassic World. People are like, too much CG, and so they're putting in animatronics and just kind of Seeing that you're excited and I'm excited for it, everybody's excited for that. So I really do think it's a great thing. And it, this yeah, I, I actually went up to um, the director of of Jurassic World 
uh, Colin at the premiere, and I said, and he said, so what'd you think? I said, you know, it would have been nice to have some more real dinosaurs. He goes, well, but we had the Apatosaurus. I said, yeah, but. So I think uh, he heard me and he heard the fans all around the world. And uh, it's really exciting that they're, they've built more dinosaurs for this one. That's awesome. That's cool. That's cool that you told him that. We'll, we'll, you know, yeah, I did. Matt Winston is the myself. reason for more animatronics confirmed. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I can't take credit. <laughs> all right. So on that note, I guess can, since we pretty much just said, you know, it's a really good thing for Jurassic World. Do you think that these these live props, these animatronics, like everything, all the you know the makeup and all that, do you think it's gonna it's gonna have a little bit more of a comeback? The past ten years or so, it's been you know the industry's been moving towards so much CG, even when it wasn't necessarily needed. Do you think this is kind of the start of bringing back the old school way of making movies potentially? Well. Number one, I would never call it old school. Uh, I think old school makes it sound antiquated. I think that, you know, we've been, you know, it's been a century of of developments in how we make movies. And so many of the techniques that were developed 100 years ago are still just as valid um, today. And I think it's really just about filmmakers realizing that and and not leaning too heavily on the newest tool just because it's the newest. What they need to get back to is, is leaning on the tools that work best for the shot. And I think that, to answer your question, I think we are in the midst of a practical effects renaissance. I think over the last few years, we've been seeing uh, so many filmmakers re-embracing the traditional way of making movies, which is not to just go onto a green screen stage, but to actually go to locations and to, and to create sets and to have wardrobe and to have makeups. And here's some examples of that. Um, uh, the Mad Max uh, reboot was all shot on location. They built those vehicles. They did those stunts. And it was thrilling because of that. Audiences were, were amazed. And I think the Star Wars uh, films have brought back practical effects in a big way. Uh, the Last Jedi, that Yoda pu- that's a Yoda puppet. The whole Yoda sequence with Luke, it's a Yoda puppet <laughs> with Frank Oz doing the voice. And... Not to mention so many other practical effects moments. Uh, Ridley Scott, with these new Aliens films, has been putting people in xenomorph suits and creating rod puppets. Um, Alien Covenant, Prometheus. Uh, Walking Dead is chock full of makeups and animatronics. Um, So I wholeheartedly see a, a, a movement back towards tactile filmmaking. And I think the reason is not not only do audiences want it back because they're tired of that sort of perfect sheen that CG gives you. They want some more texture to their movies. But I think it's also because filmmakers, that's why they got into movies in the first place. For the fun of, of being on a set. For the fun of being around amazing things. Not just being in a green screen room and leaving all the fun to post-production. Um, mm-hmm. So yeah, I, I think... We, Practical effects has a very bright future and is far from extinct. Awesome. And I'm very happy awesome. to say. Awesome. Awesome. All right, Matt. Well, thank you for your time. And I want to give you some time to really talk about the school and kind of promote it to the viewers because I know a lot of them like this stuff and maybe they'll want to get into it one day. Absolutely. Well, um, throughout my father, Stan Winston's career, he and his team. Uh, worked in secret a lot of the time to develop new techniques for bringing fantasy characters to life on film. And towards the uh, end of his life, he talked frequently about opening the doors and sharing those secrets and traveling the country and, and teaching young artists and technicians how to, how to make magic like that. Unfortunately, he, he passed away before he had a chance to do it. So we, as the family, picked up where he left off, and we, we decided to found a school in his name. And we decided to do it all online, uh, because that's how we can reach a global classroom. Uh, you know, Rather than it just being a brick-and-mortar facility that only a few people can attend, we wanted to make it totally accessible. And the mission really uh, was to um, share every technique uh, that can be used to create a character For film, television, commercials, whatever medium, bring together the best artists in the world in those techniques and have them share. And and that's what we've been doing. Um, Over the last, gosh, it's been eight years now, 
we have amassed a library of thousands of hours of in-depth training in every facet of character creation by the by the leaders in the field and it's all available to anyone in the world for a fraction of the cost of a traditional school and and what we're seeing is that um, this online method of learning works just as well as in person uh, because users are able to not not only watch it at their own pace but they can they can restart they can rewatch certain areas they get close up uh, angles they would never get in a lecture hall and the proof is in the work they're putting out I mean these students are putting out work that is professional level and this is all from you know learning through the internet so it's it's a remarkable uh, adventure for all of us and I know dad would be so thrilled and so proud that uh, we're doing our part to keep uh, practical effects and real monsters alive so check us out StanWinstonSchool.com.